It took a while for us to dial in the right approach for the co-op bot vocalizations. Initially, we recorded some in-house vocal performances and processed them heavily with the resulting sounds being very robotic. However, as the animations being created for the bots were so broad and expressive, we soon realized we were going to need to try a different sonic approach. After a few more in-house experiments, we brought in D. Bradley Baker, who we had worked with to create the voices for some of Left 4 Dead's special infected. We worked with Dee to come up with two distinct vocal and character approaches for the bots and recorded a range of responses for each. Afterward, two of our sound designers each took on one of the voices and came up with a unique sound processing approach to create a distinct sonic personality for each bot that still allowed the energy and expression of Dee's performances to shine through. In the following samples, you can hear what they sounded like in Dee's original performance and the result after the sound designers got through with them. It's important to give co-op players a way to coordinate their action. Seeing how our players naturally wanted this ability, we decided to support it with the ping timer and ended up designing some puzzles around it. Due to lag and other issues, syncing up actions over voice chat turned out to be rather difficult. Therefore we created the countdown timer as a way for players to keep in sync. It's completely predictable. Both players see the go at the same instant, and the clocks run in sync even if they are on different systems. This puzzle requires one of Portal's trickiest logical leaps. Early playtesters often took longer than their patience would allow and were nearly ripping out their hair by the time they'd finally solved it. But almost everyone insisted that the payoff was by far their favorite moment in all of co-op. We significantly reduced the average solution time by adding a puzzle just before this where two cubes repeatedly collide, but this almost completely robbed the appeal from what was once a high moment. So instead, we decided to make a few subtle adjustments and leave players with the responsibility to make the final leap. First, we added a puzzle four chambers earlier to teach players to fling by cutting their hard light bridge and falling into a surface directly below. We then subconsciously primed the thought of mid-air collision by having players repeatedly ricochet weighted spheres against a hard light bridge. Finally, we designed this room's layout, lighting, and decals so that players would see the entire space as a symmetrical whole 
and visualize the bot's fling path. By planting shards of the idea in their heads, we allow players to own that exciting dual collision epiphany while keeping their sanity intact. For a while, we were on the fence about whether to keep the team taunt hug in the game. Some felt it wasn't suitably robotic, while others had a concern that perhaps it showed too much emotion for these characters. But once it was animated for a trade show trailer, many of our concerns were washed away by the positive reaction of the fans. It was a huge success. The levels in Portal 2 are much more complex than in the first game, and as a result we've had to beef up the player movement algorithms. The player is represented as an axis line box in the world, which creates a problem for portal teleportation because portal teleportation is almost never axis aligned. To improve how we handle this, we trace the player as the axis aligned bonding box they would use on each side of a portal simultaneously, and merge the results into something usable. We have to predict quite a bit more than previous Source Engine games because portals and projected entities change the way the player moves through the world. Prediction itself is a mind-bending headache when dealing with portals. We're already dealing with a non-linear space, now we also have to deal with non-linear time in a non-linear space. Writing GLaDOS for co-op introduces some interesting problems. In single player, you can count on players paying attention and being caught up in important moments. In co-op, you can count on two players chatting about what they just did as GLaDOS delivers an important line. To help with this issue, we broke up the story beats into smaller sections so players don't become impatient. We also repeat the points multiple times to ensure the message sinks in even if you missed it a few times. Lastly, we also give players room to talk. For example, when you die, there's a two second beat for you to laugh or yell before GLaDOS speaks. It is important to give those places for players to speak because the best part of co-op is the shared experience. Доброе утро. Вы находились в консервации 50 дней. Все испытуемые в центре продолжительной консервации должны регулярно пробуждаться и выполнять упражнения для поддержания физического и умственного здоровья. Вы услышите сигнал. Когда услышите сигнал, Hi, my name is Gabe Newell, and welcome to Portal 2. When we released the original Portal in 2007, it was an experiment to see how gamers would respond to a different kind of gameplay and storytelling experience. Portal went on to win a bunch of awards, sell many copies, and, most importantly, resonate with gamers in a way that no other Valve title has. The challenges for us in building Portal 2 were to live up to people's expectations, to take you back to the world of Chell and Aperture Science, and to surprise gamers again, not with more of the same, but with more of the new. And I think it will be, mostly, a pleasant surprise. 
To listen to a commentary node, put your crosshair over the floating commentary symbol and press your Use key. To stop a commentary node, put your crosshair over the rotating node and press the Use key again. Some commentary nodes may take control of the game in order to show something to you. In these cases, simply press your Use key again to stop the commentary. Please let me know what you think after you've had a chance to play Portal 2. I can be reached at gaben at valvesoftware.com. I get about 10,000 emails each time we release a game, and while I can't respond to all of them, I do read all of them. Thanks, and have fun. The idea of being stuck forever in a state of stasis that looked like a crappy old motel room had been in our minds for a long time, but we weren't sure exactly how we wanted to rip you out of it. There was some debate over whether the opening sequence happened inside the player's head or not. There was an alternate opening where Aperture had hooked up all of its cryo-stored test subjects to an incredibly boring hotel room simulator, which Wheatley would then wake the player from. Eventually, this was discarded as too difficult to explain in the short time allotted, and we opted to change the hotel room to a container ride on a rail. This allowed us to show the player, rather than tell them, about how they and other test subjects have been stored, show some of the scale of the facility, and even hint at how much time has passed. We also get to gradually reveal all of this through the destruction of the container itself as it moves and bangs into things. Overall, this gives the player a much more dynamic and visceral introduction to Portal 2. The writers went back and forth over whether or not Wheatley had tried escaping with other test subjects before waking the player up. It was an interesting idea, and you can still hear remnants of this story arc in some of the dialogue. But at the end of the day, it was just too expansive a concept to sell. So it's hinted at, but not overtly mentioned until the end. Это предмет искусства. Вы услышите сигнал. Когда услышите сигнал, внимательно посмотрите на картину. Теперь вы ощущаете духовное обновление. Если созерцание картины не принесло должного интеллектуального удовлетворения, прослушайте отрывок музыкального произведения. Хорошо. Теперь, пожалуйста, вернитесь в постель. Доброе утро. Вы находились в консервации 9-9-9-9. Это сообщение зачитывается с целью уведомить вас. Что Эй, испытуемый есть кто-нибудь? Медленно покинуть центр развития. Я испытуемый немедленно не выйдет. Ты откроешь дверь в ближайшее Пусть время. Считать, воспользовался своим правом находить. Ха, я... а! О, мой бог! Ты выглядишь уже хорошо. Хорошо выглядишь. Ты в порядке? У тебя все... Не отвечай. Я уверен, что ты в норме. У тебя куча времени, чтобы восстановиться. Не спеши. Пожалуйста, приготовьтесь к экстренной эвакуации. Спокойно, спокойно. Он сказал, приготовьтесь. Просто приготовьтесь. Все в порядке. Хорошо? Не двигайся. Я вытащу нас отсюда. О, может, ты захочешь за что-то держаться? Очень советую на твое усмотрение. Ты в порядке? Ты меня слышишь? Эй! Большинство испытуемых через несколько месяцев в консервации демонстрируют признаки помрачения рассудка. Ты находишься тут гораздо дольше. И нельзя исключать, что у тебя может быть незначительное, серьезное повреждение мозга. Не стоит тревожиться. Хотя, если возникнет чувство тревоги, не нужно с ним бороться. Это нормальная реакция на сообщение, что у тебя поврежден мозг. Ты понимаешь, что я говорю? Понимаешь смысл? Ответь. Просто скажи «да». Так, ты прыгала. Неясно зачем. Неважно. Скажи «яблоко». Яблоко. Знаешь что, уже достаточно близко. Просто держись рядом. Все средства обеспечения безопасности реактора отключены. Пожалуйста, приготовьтесь к взрыву реактора. Ладно, не хотел говорить тебе, но придется у нас тут серьезные неприятности. Как ты там? Держишься? Резервное питание кончилось, и, конечно же, центр консервации больше не будет этих чертовых испытуемых. Подожди, это немного сложно. И, конечно же, мне никто ничего не сказал. 
Ну зачем информировать меня о жизненно важных функциях 10 тысяч чертовых испытуемых, за которых я отвечаю? О, уже близко! Тебе видно? Я пролезу? Места хватит? Ах, ведь надо как-то пройти! Так, надо сосредоточиться. И чья это будет вина, когда руководство спустится сюда и найдет 10 тысяч чертовых овощей? А, видишь, я ударился, я ударился. Так, слушай, нам надо договориться, понимаешь, чтобы ответы были одинаковые. Если кто-нибудь спросит... Не-не-не, никто не спросит, ты не волнуйся. Но если кто-нибудь спросит, скажи, что последний раз, когда ты проверяла, все были более-менее живы. Хорошо? Не мертвы. Мы почти на месте. За стеной находятся старые испытательные камеры. И там есть всякое оборудование, которое нам пригодится, если мы хотим отсюда выбраться. Думаю, там док-станция. Готово? Хорошие новости. Это не док-станция. Так что одним неизвестным меньше. Я постараюсь взять управление на себя. Возможно, это слишком технически звучит. Соберись духом. Мы почти на месте. Помни, что тебе нужна такая пушка, которая делает отверстия. Не пулевые отверстия, а... Ну, ты разберешься. Давай, соберись с духом. Фу. Вот мы на месте. Буду с тобой честен. Ты не в лучшей форме, чтобы управляться с необходимым устройством. Но, по крайней мере, ты хорошо прыгаешь. Этого не отнять. Поэтому прыгай. Буду ждать тебя впереди. The container ride destruction sequence provided some unique technical challenges. The dynamics you experience are actually computed as two separate but nested simulations. The first is a core scale simulation designed as a stress element analysis pass. This pass computes the overall gross motion of the container itself and computes the collisions and breakpoints based on path keyframe data and a network of constraints. As the container bumps and crashes along, the constraints start breaking and the room progressively starts to come apart. There are over 300 rigid bodies and 900 constraints in this rig, all individually configured for properties like tensile, friction and collision response. The core simulation portrayed gross motion that captured the main dynamics of the ride, but not the fine details. The product of the core simulation was then used to deform spline-based surfaces representing the container geometry, which in turn were parents to fine debris anchored as rigid bodies. As the surface deformations increase, anchors are broken and the fine debris rigid bodies are released into the simulation. The fine simulation also includes the interior furniture and the model detailing. The two simulations were then connected using cache data and were driven together by a series of scripts. Due to the computational complexities of having two nested simulations, we had to come up with some solutions to some interesting mathematical problems. One problem was that the nested nature of the simulations resulted in some instability in the fine debris calculations due to floating point computational limits. The solution employed for this was to compute the fine debris on a stage where the root transform of the course simulation was essentially cancelled out and stored for later use. This allowed us to more accurately detect the fine interactions between the debris and the environment. Post simulation the root transform position and inertia were reapplied to the details. We solved the problem of trying to compute the player within this highly dynamic environment by putting them in a virtual room that has all the base. Если вы чувствуете, что по вашей шее течет жидкость, немедленно лягте на спину, расслабьтесь и помассируйте виски. Это редкая реакция на поле антиэкспроприации, когда разрываются проходы в ушных раковинах в вашей голове. This room is meant to teach players the fundamentals of portals, connecting them to two places in the world. As the blue portal moves around the world, the orange stays rooted. In the original portal, this room had these portals moving by themselves on a timer. This led to most people simply staring through their orange portal, waiting for the blue one to end up in the right place. We felt that altering this to make the players decide where the portals came out was more instructive, and meant that players who already knew how to use portals could solve this puzzle both quickly and with authority. Отлично. 
отлично. В связи с техническими проблемами в настоящий момент мы не можем контролировать условия проведения испытания. Прежде чем вернуться в камеру консервации по завершении испытаний, пожалуйста, потратьте немного времени, чтобы записать результаты экспериментов. Сотрудник лаборатории разбудит вас для интервью, когда общество возродится. Если в настоящее время Земля находится под властью царя зверей, разумного облака или иного руководящего органа, который отказывается или не способен прислушаться голосу рассудка... Сэм! Эй, у тебя получилось! На той подставке должно быть портальное устройство. Эй! Ты видишь портальную пушку? Ты жива? Да, это важно. Надо было сразу спросить. We thought of making a whole new character for Portal 2, but we didn't want to lose the relationship between Gladys and Chill that began in Portal 1. Once we decided to stay with Chill, we wanted to improve her look, updating her leg springs and jumpsuit to have a more functional design. At the same time, we didn't want players to not recognize her, so we kept a lot of the iconic elements like the color orange. She has folded down her jumpsuit to show she has essentially rolled up her sleeves and shed some of the aperture label. She is awake again to test, but stronger and more determined than ever. Для ряда испытаний необходим длительный контакт со смертоносными боевыми андроидами. Заверяем вас, что все боевые андроиды были обучены чтению и получили один экземпляр законов робототехники для передачи друг другу. Хорошо, если вы чувствуете, что смертоносный боевой андроид не уважает ваши права, оговоренные в законах робототехники, пожалуйста, отметьте это в специальном формуляре. В будущем сотрудник лаборатории, ответственный за компенсацию, обязательно рассмотрит вашу жалобу. Следующее испытание очень опасно. Чтобы помочь вам сохранить хладнокровие перед лицом неизбежной смерти, на счет три вы услышите успокаивающую джазовую музыку. Один, два, три. Эта мапа была одной Starting out in the ruins of the test chambers from the first portal was our goal pretty much from day one. We wanted to give players a sense of nostalgia for what they had played, but also make it very clear that things had changed. Not only in a fictional sense, but in a graphical one as well. We needed to bridge the gap between the first game's simpler art assets and the much more complex look of Portal 2. Если центр развития подвергается бомбардировке огненными шарами, метеоритами и другими объектами из космоса, избегайте выходить на незащищенные территории, если отсутствие укрытия не является частью испытания.
Превосходно. Центр развития напоминает, что хотя ситуация может казаться безрадостной, вы не одиноки. Личностные конструкции лаборатории продолжат работать и в постапокалиптических условиях. Следующий тест демонстрирует инерцию при проходе через портал. Если законы физики в вашем будущем больше не действуют, да поможет вам Бог. Если вы не являетесь сотрудником лаборатории, much of the fun in Portal is based on the joy of the aha moment when you learn something new. The game needs a very specific pacing to ensure these moments. If things are too easy, then you're robbed of that moment since it feels like you didn't accomplish anything. If it's too hard, then players feel stupid instead of smart when they finally realize that one small part of the puzzle that they were missing. Unfortunately, trying to create that delicate balance leads to a lot of shuffling of levels and a lot of revisions and tweaks to existing levels. When we started the project, making any big structural change in a level, or the order of levels, would lead to hours or even days of busy work, trying to reconnect things and make sure they lined up again. If we ever wanted to ship something the size of Portal, with the finely tuned balance we desired, then we needed a way to be able to make the big changes to the layout of the game, without paying the cost of making everything line up again. We needed a way to bend space. We needed to think with portals. Using portals to connect different areas in the world, we could make any type of impossible space work out. You could look through a hallway into the next room, but the hallway might be on the other side of the map, and the room you were looking into might be in a completely different orientation. We could seamlessly insert an elevator, a huge expansive vista, a room that was bigger on the inside than the outside, or even create an infinite fall by connecting a shaft back into itself. Soon every connection between any space was a portal. We could even switch them on the fly. Even a simple door worked like the cartoons, just a facade painted on a wall that seamlessly opened somewhere else entirely. Once the game settled down, we were able to finalize our path and remove all the world portals. There's only one impossible space left in the whole game. See if we can figure out where it is. Ради снабжения энергии основных тестовых протоколов все средства безопасности были отключены. Центр развития уважает ваше право выражать озабоченность в связи с проводимой политикой. Эй! Эй, эй! Я тут! О, супер! Ты нашла портальную пушку! Это прекрасная иллюстрация, что люди с повреждениями мозга в конечном итоге настоящие герои, правда? Какая храбрость! Проходи насквозь! This interaction with Wheatley was the first that we hooked up for our initial showing at E3. It demonstrated how Wheatley would be an actor in the world, and how the player would not only be interacting with him directly, but also using him to interact with the Aperture facility. The Wheatley model was designed as a mechanical version of the original Portal 1 personality sphere. Originally, they filled a very similar role to that in Portal 1, so we needed one base model which could hold a lot of different expressions. Experimenting with different rigging ideas, we came up with the onion skin design, where a number of spherical plates could slide around inside each other, all supported on a small motion platform mounted on a gyroscope. This meant that no matter what expression Wheatley was pulling, he always retained his spherical shape. The modelers and the animators collaborated closely on these early tests to make sure the design supported the range of expression needed to satisfy any personality sphere that got designed. Lots of ideas were thrown out, such as a small internal robot arm that Wheatley could pull out of one of his ports and pull himself around with. We were careful to make the mechanics look plausible, but we had to cheat the eyelids, since they ended up being a physical impossibility. There was no way all that geometry could fit into the space around his eye without clipping out the other side. 
but they were such an essential feature of the model that we resorted to crushing them up inside the eye where the player can't see them. How do you make a giant mechanical eyeball express life and emotions? let alone give the impression that he's talking when he has no mouth. The animator's understanding of human behavior came in handy for bringing Wheatley the personality sphere to life. Talking is so much more than just moving a character's mouth. You have to use body language, head attitudes, and rhythm of movement and eye focus to indicate a character's feelings and motivations. Slow, smooth head moves, a steady gaze, and a relaxed eye aperture indicate that Wheatley is calm. Short, sharp head turns, rapid blinks, and glancing around indicate nervousness or deceit. Add a tightly constricted eye aperture and a little shiver to show fear. Tilting the body away while keeping the eye focused on the player signals an attempt at cleverness that ultimately only fools Wheatley himself. Suspicion is communicated by squinting his eyelids and handles, which function as very expressive eyebrows and cheeks. It's also fun to remind the player that Wheatley is a machine. When hacking, his eye and body segments become perfectly centered and spin mechanically, inspired by the spinning tape reels on old Univac computers. And when he wants to look far in front, he flips his eye all the way over to the other side of his head. This animation approach, combined with the writing and vocals, makes Wheatley quite a unique and entertaining character. Part human, part machine, all eye and no brain.